Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Well, hi, everybody. It's very nice to, to meet you all. Uh, I'm Dave Tabb. I'm a professor, as we mentioned, right across the, the rail yard over at the Tigerberg, camp, uh, Tiger, Tigerberg Hospital campus of Stellenbosch University. Uh, and the Medical Research Council pays for me to travel around to different universities and do training and stuff. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the chance to, to come be here. Uh, as you can tell by my accent, I am not from here. Probably some of you have already pinned down the country I must come from. I moved here from the United States at the end of 2015. Uh, but I've really enjoyed living here, and maybe I'll just end up staying. Is that okay? <laughs> okay, cool. All right. So um, today we're going to start with bioinformatics. I, I have to be the first to admit that this is a bit of a, uh, a drinking from the fire hose phenomenon. This lecture covers a lot of topics, but what I want you to understand is how we get from something the sequencer dumped out to an annotated genome. That's a pretty long stretch of things. So the first part of this process is one that we're going to call assembly. How do we work from a bunch of reads off of a sequencer into long stretches of sequence to contigs or chromosome style um, pieces of DNA? And then how do we determine what the important bits of that DNA would be? We, th we speak of this as the problem of annotation. How do we find where genes are? How do we figure out what those putative genes do? So uh, assembling and annotation then are these two key processes that frame all of today's uh, talk. The other two topics that we're doing are, uh, are focused on uh, amplicon sequencing bioinformatics, uh, dealing with things like microbiome research or uh, how you design primers, things like that. That'll be the lecture that we have, I've already shot for video. Um, and then the other piece of this lecture will be about uh, gene expression. And it has a lot to do with statistics, actually. So we're going to talk about that in the first week of May. All right. So let's proceed ahead to our outline. It looks like kind of a complex overview, and it kind of is. So it, it splits into halves, as I said. The first part is, how do we get an assembly? So we're going to talk about uh, paired end sequencing as this key technology that enables us to do good assemblies. We're going to talk about the problem of repeats or repetitive DNA. Uh, and then from there, we'll talk about KMERS. We're going to talk a little bit about algorithms and data structures. And I know that's going to be exciting for everyone, but it is before lunch, so I don't want to see any shut eyes, all right? From there, we're going to talk about annotation. Uh, HMM might seem like a, a, someone's just saying, hmm, Matthew, but in fact, it stands for Hidden Markov Model. Uh, as we get to that, we'll discuss how we spot where genes are in just a long stretch of uninterrupted DNA. From there, we'll talk about homology search, which is one of the most commonly used applications in bioinformatics. How do you find more sequences like this one? Uh, and from there, we'll talk about domains and motifs, which uh, refers to how we learn about little, uh, little, parts of, uh, little parts of protein sequences, for example, that are associated with particular functions. All right. So that's, that's the very big picture. Let's now talk even bigger about all the different things that we could be doing within the sequencing world. As I mentioned, we're going to be spending some time talking about gene expression and microarrays. That, that's going to show up in May. Uh, I, I, I have in the past given a lot of talks about uh, doing high throughput sequencing for looking for variants. Um, this is not really where we're going to uh, be uh, working today. So we're mostly going to be focusing on this very leftmost limb of this diagram, just working through how we get a, a continuous genome sequence how we figure out what it does. All right. So let's start with paired end sequencing. This is what I consider to be one of the most, uh, the most important concepts in understanding how assembly works. But I, I frequently, I find that people don't really understand what it does. So I think it's, it's really valuable if we can spend a little moment with that. Let's start with the fact that sequencing doesn't start with one long contiguous sequence. Typically, when we're running a sequencing reaction, we're focused on little uh, short segments of sequence, maybe up to 10,000 nucleotides in length, something like that. And we're not going to sequence the entirety of these 10,000 nucleotide stretches. Instead, we're going to sequence a patch at this end, and we're sequencing another patch at the other end. So how, hey there, come on in. So how long uh, can, how long a sequence can you produce with old school Sanger style sequencers. Does anyone know? Okay, an old school Sanger sequencer, like the, the ones that actually got the Human Genome Project completed, could do about 384 different sequences all at the same time. 
And each of those sequence reads would be 500 nucleotides or 600 nucleotides long. Now, when we run something like the MySeq, do we get sequencing stretches that are five and 600 nucleotides long? We do not, they're much shorter. Um, I think that in uh, one of its most frequently used modes, it can do about 150 nucleotides in a row. And a lot of uh, high throughput sequencers use even, uh, produce even smaller patches of sequence than that, maybe only 50 nucleotides. So um, if, you, if you think about this stretch of DNA being a couple thousand or 10,000 nucleotides in length, you're getting actually a very small patch of sequence at the, three, uh, at the three prime end and a very small patch of sequence at the five prime end. I've got those reversed in my head, sorry. Uh, so why does it matter to us that we have two patches of sequence that have some distance in between them that we know with less precision? Why is that useful? That's one of the things, one of the key concepts I'd really like you to have uh, to, to take away from this lecture. That having the knowledge that these sequences come in pairs and that these two sequences are oriented opposite to each other at some distance from each other is very, very valuable in the process of assembly. Okay? So paired end sequencing helps us to know that these two sequences are related to each other spatially. They're quite close together. All right. Now, uh, I've, I've shown, I'm going to show you three different visualizations of paired end sequencing. You just saw one that showed like the, where the primers sit and stuff like that. That's kind of the molecular biology end of, of how this works. This is a figure taken from a paper that was fresh when I was in grad school by another grad student in the same program, actually. But it's turned out to be a bit of a classic. So imagine each of these blue stretches represent one physical piece of DNA. And those dark blue patches represent the paired end sequences. They're paired because you've got one on either end of the stretch of, of DNA. So if each of those little blue bars is a different stretch of, of DNA, oh, the slides will be available uh, from, from the, uh, my Google Drive. There's a link for it directly from the YouTube video. So you'll be able to get those as well. I, should, I, I always try to mention that on camera too. All right, so we have all these different pieces of DNA. From each of them, we've sequenced a patch on either end. And now we want to pile them all up. We want to see how these dark blue patches overlap, because those are going to give us the ability to build a longer sequence than the 50 nucleotides or 150 nucleotides that we can do with this particular instrument. And that's great so long as they are contiguous. So what we're, what we're looking at in this diagram is a projection downward. We've stacked up all of these blue stretches. And where they're contiguous, we have a long red bar at the bottom. But we also have places that are not covered by a dark blue bar, like this little gap right here, or this little gap right here, and so on. So those gaps are really problematic. In the end, we want to have end-to-end -end sequence. So that's, that's the goal. But at, at some point, we're going to have to deal with these contigs that we've produced and figure out which contigs are next to each other. So this is, the, this is the real advantage we're going to get out of paired end sequencing. Now, before we go there, I want to mention kind of the villain in this picture, and that would be repetitive DNA. Our genomes are absolutely loaded with sequences that just repeat all over the place. Have you guys encountered any of these? Have you talked about uh, things like alu elements? OK, well, this is, this is a little. Uh, taxonomy of repetitive DNA I've assembled out of, a, out of this article down here in 2013. So we've got transposable elements, variable number tandem repeats. Have people heard of repeats? Yes. Good. OK, great. <laughs> We're in a good place. So short tandem repeats like microsatellites would be uh, one example of that. Many satellites are even longer regions. Of course, ends of chromosomes tend to be uh, rather repetitive as well. So just lots and lots of repetitive DNA is not necessarily, no one's going to confuse that for a gene, right? But uh, DNA like this can pose the same risk as this other type I'm going to talk about. So transposable elements are, uh, represent something of an infection that our genome has been fighting off a few million years. Might sound like a very strange idea, but there's, there's pretty good evidence, I think, that uh, for the last, uh, that, that a few, several million years ago, the, spe the species that evolved to become us and say apes and so on, that they were, they were fighting this infection more or less, that within their genomes they had these transposable elements, and those transposable elements were aggressively making more and more copies of themselves all over the genome. 
Now that's kind of dangerous, right? Because if one of these transposable elements ends up in the middle of one of your coding genes, you lose that gene, basically. So that's not a great scenario. Uh, over time, our genomes evolve the ability to deactivate certain portions of DNA. Have you heard of uh, epigenomics? Okay, so and, uh, and one of the things that we do within our DNA is to mark it with methylations, and those methylations can prevent a region of DNA from being transcribed further. So, um, so all these transposable elements, particularly this nasty alu, uh, uh, have, have, have stopped being real problems to us because those bit, they, they lie in bits of DNA that have just been turned off. But we have thousands and thousands of copies of alu all over our, our genomes. So how big is the human genome? There are lots of different ways you could measure that. We could say, how many nucleotides have we got? Does anyone have a number on that? I think the number is something like 3 billion. I, I, I kind of get lost in really large magnitudes. So a huge amount of DNA. But how much of that is actually useful? Uh, it, it, sorry, that's, that's really unfair. How much, how much of our genome codes for protein. I'm a proteins guy. I tend to think everything else doesn't matter. That's not fair, but okay. <laughs> so how many, how many protein coding genes might you find in a human genome of 3 billion nucleotides? 25,000? Yeah, I think the, the most common number I hear tossed around is 22,000. When I was in grad school, there were still people like me saying, no, 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 we're much more complex than a yeast. Yeast get by on 6,200 genes. Well, we must have 100,000. Well, I was deeply wrong. About 22,000 seems to be the number of genes that we have. So you can imagine that these 20, 20 odd thousand genes spaced across 3 billion nucleotides leave an awful lot of empty space. But that empty space frequently has either transposable elements or vari variable number tandem repeats buried within it. Okay, that's problematic because of this little diagram up here. And it, it's a little complex, but I think it's a, a good one for us to talk about just the same. Let us imagine that we are talking about two different regions within the genome. I have a, a gene called uh, A and a gene called B. They're close together. And I have another gene C and gene D, and they're close together. Now, these genes have absolutely nothing to do with each other. They're just four genes happening to hang out in the genome somewhere. However, between genes A and B, there's this repeat. We'll call it one of these ALU sequences, okay? So gene a, gene a and Gene B are separated by an ALU. And over here in this other part of the genome, we have Gene C and D, nothing to do with A and B, and they also are separated by an ALU. This is the problem, because sometimes assembly may create the wrong impression that because A is five prime to an ALU, and Gene D is three prime to an ALU, Gene A must come right next to Gene D. Do you see the problem? Sneaky. Right, so if you have a repetitive element that appears in multiple places, it may mistakenly create the impression that things that are quite far apart are actually close together. That's problematic. So we need to be able to screen these guys out so that they don't interfere with the assembly process because otherwise very distant features will mistakenly be juxta juxtaposed, stuck together. Okay, so um, I also want to note that this paper that, that I'm talking about from 2002 is about the arachne uh, uh, genome assembler. Um, I find the name kind of difficult. That, that's a globe, perhaps? I'm not sure. But this, this paper came from an individual's PhD thesis. And in his PhD thesis back in 2002, he was able to demonstrate that you could assemble an entire Drosophila genome on a desktop PC. This is not something people thought was possible before. Now, what is Drosophila? Does anyone know the name? Drosophila melanogaster? It's a dragonfly. Uh, not the dragonfly. It is a fly. Fruit fly. The fruit fly, exactly. <laughs> when, I was, when, I was in, uh, when I was in genetics back as an undergrad, I, I came back to my dorm and I was talking excitedly about the experiment of trying to keep the, the, the females all separated from the males in these, in these tubes. And they were like, Dave, you're a fruit fly pimp. And they wanted to get me a hat with a big feather and stuff like that. And I was like, that's... That's deeply weird. That's deeply weird. Okay, so um, repetitive DNA is bad, but this Baxiglow doctoral thesis was the, the basis for launching arachne, which became one of the chief tools used in assembling the human genome. I think that's just a really remarkable, um, you know, wildly impactful process that all comes out of writing a PhD thesis. 
Okay, so let us talk then about some of the problems that might come to us. One of the things that you should know about modern sequencers, about next generation sequencers, is that they produce lots and lots of sequences all at the same time, which means that you may have sequences that contain errors within them. We are going to spend, actually in the video that you're going to see for the second part of this, you will learn about FRED scores, which is how we assess the, the probability of error at any one position within sequences. So you can imagine in a whole bunch of sequences that you've accumulated for one particular patch, you might see that occasionally you have mismatches. So these are all T's, these are all A's. But in this, this position that the arrow is coming from, we see that it's a bunch of C's with one T in there. Well, that's kind of problematic. The T is obviously a mismatch. Everything else aligns just fine. So what's the problem? Here we see that the T is given a score of 30. Now, I'm going to give you a bit of shorthand. When you're, when you're looking at a FRED score like this, this is a quality score, uh, you can simply knock off one of the zeros, which gives you three, raise 10 to that power. 10 to the third power is what? You didn't know there was Thousand. math, right? Oh, what was that? Thousand. Thousand, very nice, yes. Well, well done for you. All right, so T, uh, T score, uh, T's score is 30. We know that three raise, uh, 10 raised to the third power is 1,000. So the chance of error at that position is one in 1,000, okay? So you might think one in 1,000, that's vanishingly small. This thing's gotta be right. But I want to point out that millions and millions of sequences were output by the sequencer. And the chance that any one, uh, that any one letter could be wrong in that pile uh, must account for the fact that there are lots and lots of such sequences. So occasionally, you're going to see that you have a very high FRED score, a very low probability of error associated with a, a single base call, and it's just wrong. It's just wrong, even though it might seem statistically very unlikely. So in the software, it has the ability to overrule things. When, when everyone around the table says they want pepperoni and somebody says, I want anchovies, you overrule that person, of course. And sequencers can do the same, uh, sequence assembly software can do exactly the same thing. We can rule out that, uh, that T call, replace it with a C, and say we have basically zero uh, confidence in it. So the, the zero is, is just standing in there to say, well, this, this letter has been edited to C, but it can't add to the confidence of the base calls around it. Okay, great. So now let us return to our fine question of paired end sequencing. We showed you the molecular biology version of it with the, the three prime and five prime primers, etc. We've also shown them as light blue bars that had these dark blue patches on the ends, the dark blue patches representing the part we actually sequence. You're going to see yet a third representation of paired-end sequences here. So in this case, these arcs represent a, a contiguous piece of DNA, and the patch, or the, the, the horizontal line on either end of it, that now represents the part that got sequenced. So if you have a contig, a whole, you stitch together a bunch of contiguous sequence from these reads, and another contig over here that you've stitched together by finding a bunch of overlapping reads, you can tell that this contig is next to that contig because there are, in this case, three pieces of DNA that run from one contig, the, the patch of sequence over here, to a patch of sequence over here. That's where the value comes in. Because we know that these pieces of sequence came from opposite ends of one piece of DNA, we're able to learn how the contigs are oriented with relationship to each other. All good? Okay, that's one of my favorite things to ask about on, on papers. What, why do we bother with paired end sequencing? So I, I always try to emphasize that one very heavily here. Okay, a moment for the teacup. Moving to a country that enjoys tea was the best move. <laughs> mm. Wonderful. Okay. So, how does this work algorithmically? Now, I, I know that you're all really excited about learning a bit about programming. I will not be teaching you to program in this course, unfortunately. It's, it's a fun exercise, and it works for some people and not for others. But, we are going to talk a little bit about a data structure. <laughs> And a KMER is one of the most fundamentally useful data structures that comes from all of bioinformatics. It gets used in a lot of different uh, representations. So we start with the idea 
that a k-mer is designed to represent a unique sequence found in one location in the genome. We typically use a k-mer length of something like 25 nucleotides in a row. And that's okay for most applications. Now, if we're talking about the 25 nucleotides that are most commonly seen in an alu, well, that exact same sequence may appear all over the place in the genome. So we're going to have to do a few things with these. So if we have a particular 25 where the K value is set to 25, uh, you, you can use it for a, a wide variety of things. The first is that you can say for a particular 50 base pair, of, a 50 nucleotide read that I have, how many different 25 MERS can I break it up into? It's 50 nucleotides. How many, how many different 25 letter sequences can I pull out of that 50 MER? Does anyone have an answer? 26? That is a, a very good response, actually. Yes, there are 26 different positions you can put this. The common answer I get from that is actually two. People think, well, you've got the 25 MER starting at the left end, and you've got the 25 MER ending at the right end. But in fact, there are all those other positions in between. So you can think of this 50-letter sequence as being a whole bunch of 25-letter sequences, one starting at the first letter, a different one starting at the second letter, a different one starting at the third letter, the fourth, the fifth, and so on until you get to the 26th position. Okay, so we can, we can take a sequence of arbitrary length and turn it into a large number of k-mers as a result. So we can also, because this is computers, we can sort things really bloody well. So even if you have several billion different k-mers, you can still sort them uh, so that you know exactly how many times a given k-mer appears in your sequencing data. All right? Now that's very powerful. So we can start by doing things like excluding high count k-mers. So if you have a sequence that is a very, very common feature uh, of the genome, like an ALU sequence, uh, then you might have this same sequence appearing at thousands of places in the genome, thus having a really inflated count in the KMER catalog that you've built from the sequencing reads. If so, those are going to be really big outliers. You're going to have a huge count of how many times you've seen these sequences that we know to be associated with pseudogenes or um, repeat regions or whatever. So just scratching all of those out is one of these steps that we're just going to take. We're just going to get rid of them, and any time we have one of these repetitive sequences, we're going to have to come back and figure out how to stitch them properly. So excluding high-count camers is one way to get rid of all the repeats that we have from DNA sequencing reads. Now, overlapping reads will share camers. That, what, what am I even talking about here? This is kind of a, a complex thing. So let us say... Uh, that we want to find which sequences overlap with a sequencing read. If you have a hundred sequences, that's pretty straightforward. You can say, well, this one shares sequence with that one and with that one. I can overlap them. That's fine. But when you have millions of sequences, determining which reads overlap gets to be a really big, ugly problem. That is, in a large part, the problem of, of DNA assembly. Now, we'll, we'll talk briefly about how that uh, gets handled, but let's just start with this concept that reads can overlap in k-mers. So if I have a 50 nucleotide read over here and a 50 nucleotide read over here, it might be that they overlap very barely. Maybe they share 12 nucleotides. That's not much of an overlap. In a case like that, you don't have a k-mer shared between this 50 and this 50, because the overlap region is so small that no k-mer is smaller than that overlap size. So that's not viable. Uh, so that's the first problem. Overlap is less than k in length, therefore they don't share a k-mer. You can't declare that these overlap. You may have base call errors. We already mentioned the problem that we might have a location that's clearly a C in the genome, but one of our sequencing reads just mistakenly threw a T in that position. So something like that could mean that even though these two reads do overlap by a k-mer, by a 25 nucleotide region, they don't agree completely in what those sequences should be. So we have to be careful about these regions that, uh, uh, about the, the impact of base calling errors. 
Okay, so KMERS end up being one of the fundamental data structures that we use for doing assembly because they make it very fast for us to determine whether this read has any other, uh, has a KMER in common with any other reads. All right, now De Bruyne, I'm sorry, I, I pronounce this like an American and we call it De Bruyne. Uh, how would you pronounce that here? You probably have an, uh, your, your uh, re ability to read Dutch names is probably a lot better than mine. <laughs> we don't know what the J, if you take out the J, it's De Bruyne. De Bruyne. J is weird. De Bruyne, okay. The brain. Okay, so the brain graphs are one of the ways that we figure out how we can walk from one camer to the next camer to the following camer. So we've gotten a little weird here. We started with reads. We kind of knew what that was. That's what the sequencer dumps on us. We digested that up into segments that were fixed in length, 25 mers that we called camers. But now we need to figure out how to join, what, what is the path through all of the camers that we produced that gives us the longest possible contig. All right, that is kind of messy. So the brain graphs are one of the key ways that we do this assembly. The picture is pretty. The concept is actually quite complex. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a section from this paper uh, to give you some sense of the, the bigger picture of it. Uh, I, I appreciate that this, this step is not one that easily, uh, that, that's easily understood by everybody. I really struggled with this one personally. So, modern short read assembly algorithms construct a de brain graph by representing all Kamer prefixes and suffixes, these are to say all the little 25 mers you can chop out of a read, uh, by representing all of these uh, prefixes and suffixes as nodes, and then drawing edges that represent Kamers having a particular prefix and suffix. For example, the Kamer edge ATG, here they're, they're using just a three letter sequence to be the, the size of the Kamers, has a prefix of AT and a, C, and a suffix TG. All right, there are two competing approaches for, di for, for dissecting these crazy graphs, the, the brain graphs that have been created into sequence. One is called the Hamiltonian cycle, which is kind of the old school way to do it, but people have found that Wehlerian cycles are preferred. So finding a, oh, an Wehlerian cycle allows one to reconstruct the genome by forming an alignment in which each successive Kamer, remember we're trying to walk from Kamer to Kamer to get a long contact sequence, is shifted by one position, which is to say that each Kamer must overlap by 24 with the last 25 letter Kamer that, uh, Kamer that we were at. This generates the same cyclic genome sequence without performing the computationally expensive task of finding a Hamiltonian cycle. Whew, okay, so that was quite a lot. In the, in the end, we start with reads that are produced by the sequencer. The reads get dissected into sets of kamers, and then we have to figure out how to walk from one kamer to the next to get our way all the way across a contiguous region of sequence. This is, this is found by this Wehlerian cycle process of dissecting the, this graph, the Debrain graph, that we've created from all the capers. Okay, so some of that is going to stick and some of it is not. I don't tend to ask you why, uh, why Wehlerian cycles are preferable to Hamiltonian cycles in trying to dissect these graphs, but it, it's useful to at least know where these, where these concepts relate. So that's where we're going to leave that subject. Okay, now we have started with a bunch of sequencer reads. We've made some judgments about them and now we've built an assembly from them. So how is one long piece of DNA different from an annotated genome? Is, is, it, is it an annotated genome just a long DNA sequence? It is not. Just as your books have spaces to separate words and punctuation to separate sentences and white space to separate paragraphs, the human genome, for example, is going to be marked as being split up into chromosomes. It's going to have maybe uh, cytogenetic bands mapped onto it. We might say, for example, this is 27P, the 27P region of a chromosome. It's going to be marked even further into things like open reading frames, and enhancers and promoters. This information that we deduce about landmarks within the genome are what we call annotation. 
But annotation doesn't just announce itself. If you've got an assembled sequence that you've produced, it doesn't just tell you where all the interesting bits are. That process is actually quite expensive. So we're going to try to talk about, excuse me, three different ways that we can put an annotation on sequencing data. The first of these is called hidden Markov models. The second one will be sequence alignment. And then the third one will be domain and motif matching. Let me swing the camera a bit to the left. I'm kind of over here. It's all right. OK. <clears throat> now, hidden Markov models are a little complex. But what I'm going to try to explain is that they relate <coughs> that biological features can be broken up into pieces. For example, a transmembrane domain. A transmembrane domain has we think of as being a hydrophobic bit of protein that stretches through a membrane. So if you, if you uh, are, are trying to model a transmembrane protein, you're going to have bits of, uh, bits of the protein that are clearly not within the membrane at all, that are cytosolic, protein, uh, cytosolic sequences. You're going to have bits that are the start of a transmembrane region. You'll have the part that actually traverses the membrane. You'll have the part that ends the transmembrane domain. And then you'll have the part that's extracellular, for example. OK? So by decomposing a biological feature into pieces, we hope to find that those pieces have particular sequence preferences. OK, so just to return to the transmembrane domain for, for a moment, what would we expect of the parts of protein that cross a bilipid layer, a lipid bilayer, I'm sorry, I'm mangling myself today. What, what, is, what is the chief property of the inside of a lipid bilayer? Hydrophobicity. Hydrophobicity, very good, right. So we've got these long carbon chains, the fatty acids, poking into the inside of this membrane. That's a very hydrophobic environment. As a result, if you have a protein that's crossing this membrane, you're going to expect that the amino acids that you find in that region will correspondingly be hydrophobic. So we know that some amino acids are highly hydrophilic, hydrophilic, like arginine, for example. Arginine is kind of like a catcher's mitt for protons. It's really, really basic. It might, uh, you might not expect to see something like a proline in, in such a region, because proline tends to put a big kink in proteins. So that's not too likely. So instead, you might see a whole lot of leucines and alanines and valines and isoleucines. These are, these are long aliphatic chain side, chain, uh, side chains to amino acids. So this, this, uh, the, the function of this part of the sequence has clear implications for the sequence that is acceptable for this region. All right. So in the same way, hidden Markov models dissect a, a particular biological feature into the different pieces that have different functions and thus implications on what sequences should be found there. So in this case, we have some sort of biological concept here shown by the red boxes, and we've modeled it to, in, to involve walking through state 0, either state 1 or B, then state 2, then state 3 A or B, and then state 4. Okay, so this is just some arbitrary process. We've decided that all biological features of this type follow some sequence through those, that set of boxes. And then these boxes have outputs to them. You might see this sequence resulting from this biological feature, or you might see this sequence coming from this biological feature. They're they're, you can evaluate these as, as probabilistic interpretations because you know that this state has a penchant for outputting this type of letter. Okay, so when we think about a, a, a hidden Markov model, it represents, the, the, each little box represents some small part of a biological feature, each of which is associated with uh, what we're going to call transition probabilities, which is to walk into the next red box in series, and emission probabilities that relate to what sequences might you see if you were in this part of, of this biological feature. All right. Now, uh, again, fitting, a, fitting such a model is, is, really is really something that's best left to experts, I think. But 
you should know that hidden Markov models are our principal way of finding protein coding genes in a long contig of sequence. I mean, how would you, how would you look at a, at a DNA sequence and just decide what the, what, where a protein sits, where a protein is, is coded for? That's hard to do. Hidden Markov models know that different features of genes have different sequence probabilities. I'm going to tell you, you already know one of these. For example, what is one of the most common types of promoters? Promoters. <coughs> What's that? He said what? <laughs> Okay. All right. That's a T7 promoter. Okay. One that we learned about really early on in my cell biology classes was called the Tata box. It's kind of a silly name for the thing. But why do we call it a Tata box? Because it's a bunch of T and A letters. <laughs> so if you're, if you're modeling a gene structure and you're modeling the promoter, you might expect to have very high emission probabilities for T and A nucleotides and not for C and G. Everyone sees that? Okay, so that's an example of how a particular feature within a, 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 a particular unit of this biological structure relates to the sequences you might see for it. All right, so uh, there are a series of algorithms that we use for establishing a hidden Markov model, for attempting to find where these models best fit to a sequence, and how we determine uh, which parts of the sequence correspond to which parts of the model. I would just, it, you, you may see these mentioned in papers from time to time. I would rather that you knew what they are. So Baum-Welch means that we want to train a hidden Markov model from a data set of sequences. So it will find the most likely set of state, transition, and emission probabilities. This is what creates a hidden Markov model for us. So maybe we know about 500 sequences for this species, 500 proteins. We, we know where to find their genes in that genome. So we could point to these different sequences, split them up into the parts that we know to be promoters, parts that we know to be introns, parts that we know to be exons, and then the software will construct the hidden Markov model for us from these sequences that we've marked in this way. But that's not where we want to stop. By creating the hidden Markov model, we are giving ourselves the ability to find more gene structures that follow the same rules in this genome. So we make our, our HMM with Baum-Welch. Then we have some new sequence that we want to find hits on. We want to find where are the genes in this piece of DNA. So we can then pass the sequence through that and use what's called the forward-backward algorithm. It's kind of an odd name, isn't it? to score that sequence against the HMM, which will compute what is the best probability that this sequence would result from this model. So maybe as this model scrunches across this long contig, we get a, a, a big, uh, a high probability over here, and a high probability here, and an okay probability here. We can prioritize then our finding of genes to where we got good probabilities from our hidden Markov model. And finally, the Viterbi algorithm. It's, it's not enough to simply say, well, we think there's a gene here. We would really like the software to tell us what's, what's the structure of the of gene that corresponds to this part of the sequence. And Viterbi is good for that. So associate parts of the test sequence to different components of this biological feature. Where do we, where do we step from state to state in sequence to maximize the probability that this really is a good gene, inter, uh, gene interpretation? Okay, so one of the, the most common ones that uh, was, was in early use was produced just after I started in grad school. I went to grad school back in 1996, very long time ago. So, does it seem a long time ago? Were you guys born in 1996? Yeah. Oh, that's good news. Well done. I, I, was, uh, I was a very intimidated grad student showing up at, at University of Washington. I'd never lived on the West Coast in my life. Okay, so... You guys, did you guys move a long way to go to, to come to Honors? Or are, are, are you from Cape Town? Cape Town, it's lovely. What a great place to grow up. It's a nice place. All right. So we have different features that we can use as part of the hidden Markov model that we use in GeneScan. 
And I'm showing you half of the model because it might find a gene on the, uh, the, the coding strand or it might be that we have a gene on the complementary strand. So generally speaking, we're going to sit in this region, the, inter, the intergenic region, where we have some basic level of how frequently do we see A, C, G, uh, G and T. And then we hit a region that's got a whole bunch of A and T in it. For something like that, we now the, the model can now shift over into the promoter model, part of the model, to say that this is best explained if it's a promoter. Then we get to the five prime UTR. Everyone remember UTR? Untranslated region, okay. It might be that you have just a single exon as part of this open reading frame, in which case you would come to this part, pass into the three prime untranslated region, polyadenylation site, and then the intergenic region. So that's, that's a, very, a very short cycle for finding a very simple, tiny gene structure. However, it might be that what you're looking at with that first exon is just a first exon that leads into an exon, uh, that leads into an intron region and then back out through an intron, uh, another exon. So, as you can see, exons have different reading frames. The exon might appear in reading frame one or it might be offset by one nucleotide or by two nucleotides versus that, that reading frame. So, we have that big mishmash up at the top to reflect that we're going to be walking uh, among uh, introns and exons of different reading frames until we finally get back out. Happily, we can rely on software to untangle what the exon structure is for a gene because doing this manually took a long time. It took a really long time for those very first genes uh, to be picked out. So hidden Markov models are our way of finding more features that look like ones that we've seen in the past. You've got 500 uh, gene structures that you've worked out meticulously by hand. You can train a hidden Markov model on it and then run it against the, uh, the, whole, the, the rest of the genomic sequence to tell you where the other genes are that follow the same constraints. So that's very powerful. So it might surprise you to think that sequences can be specific to particular features like this. So I would, I would just point out something like uh, GTAG. So GT is typically the end of one exon, and AG is the start of the next exon. So the, the intron sequence can be stripped out, but if you don't see a GT at the end of an exon, um, it might be one of, uh, one of the non-conforming uh, boundaries between exons. So we have pretty clear reason to think that the sequences we see at different parts of these structures are very indicative of what part of the gene we're at. Okay. All right, so hidden Markov models are complex. I think everyone can agree on that score. Um, but they are very useful when you're trying to find more things like this. From the next part, though, we want to talk about one of the, the algorithms that is considered one of the greatest hits of bioinformatics. And you've probably used it at some point. Have you heard of BLAST? Yes. yes. Great. Okay. Great. So do you feel comfortable in, ex in explaining how BLAST works? After today, you are an expert. <laughs> so, let us walk through it. But why bother? Why do we need to align sequences? What's, what's the value to be, uh, to be accomplished by, by blasting stuff? Number one, recognizing orthologs. Orthologs are what we frequently call the same gene in another species. So, do I have orthologs with baker's yeast? Yes, yes. I share a common ancestor with baker's yeast, okay. and as a result, if you look at how I do glycolysis, you will see similarities between my gene for, for uh, the glycolytic enzymes as you do in yeast. Do I have uh, common ancestors with um, chimpanzees? Yes, yes I do. There, there's very clear evidence from the protein sequences that we use, that we use the same mechanisms for a great many operations. And the, the, the closer you get over the, the space of evolution, the, the, more, uh, the, the greater the similarity you expect to see in the orthologs, the, the common proteins we share with other species to accomplish these. Are there human proteins that have no orthologs in other species? Actually, it's quite the opposite. Um, every species has genes that no other species has. If you look at uh, a given bacterium, 
uh, you're probably going to find some, you know, 20%, 30% of its genome consists of sequences that don't have orthologs elsewhere. But there's an awful lot that's shared among species as well. I've been doing uh, some, some looking at maize and sorghum. Maize and sorghum. And between maize and sorghum, I was able to find clear orthologs for 20,000 of the 45,000 genes, uh, protein sequences I had for sorghum, just as a, as a point of example. That's, that was being very restrictive about what I called a pair. So orthologs exist. If an orthologue exists for a protein, it's much easier to learn about what it does uh, because it's generally been studied somewhere else as well. Okay, but that is not the only kind of duplication. You don't have to go to another species to find a sequence that's similar to this one. We also have genomes that have evolved through a process of duplication, partial duplication along the way. Now, if you're working in trees, heaven help you, because you've got so many paralogs, so many duplicate genes of, of each, uh, uh, each sequence that you're in really big trouble. We have some paralogy, we have some degree of gene duplication that's taken place in our genomic histories as well. So paralogs are useful. Generally speaking, at least in, in humans, you, you typically find that gene duplicates don't both continue down the, evolu down the evolutionary histories unless they come to fill different functional roles in our cells. Now, our bodies are really, really good at reusing uh, sequences for purposes that they're not really, that they weren't born for, right? One example would be crystallins in our eye, which actually bear a, f a fair amount of similarity to a particular enzyme. But they're also quite good at just sitting there and refracting light, so we get to use them for that. So, paralogs are an example of how you can find other genes within the same species that have great sequence similarity. Finally, recognizing conserved regions. If you see that biology is tinkering with a particular sequence quite regularly, um, that over generations we see this part of the sequence changing quite a lot, there's probably some sort of evolutionary advantage to doing so. For example, the, uh, the proteins that the influenza virus presents on its outside, if those proteins stayed exactly the same from year to year to year, well, one vaccine would do you for life. But what we instead see is that the, these, uh, uh, the, the proteins that appear on the outside of, a, of, a, of uh, an influenza virus change sequence quite readily. And so we find that we need a new vaccine every year to try to keep up with the sequence changes that have happened. Okay, so recognizing conserved regions tells you some stuff you just can't muck with or you lose that functionality and you break the cell. So finding conserved regions matters. All right, so there are several different ways that we can look at this. So from global and local, I want to point out that you might be trying to find um, small regions that are repeated uh, across different sequences. We would call this a local alignment to try to find a, a, a common subsequence between these, these queries and the database strings. We might be doing a global alignment, though, where we know the full protein sequence from here and the full protein sequence from here, and we want to see how those align. So a global versus a local split is one of the, the ways that different uh, search algorithms may be tuned to different purposes. An optimal versus a heuristic approach is, is worth studying as well. There are some search algorithms that are guaranteed to give you the best possible match under a certain set of rules. We would call those optimal scoring algorithms. But most of the searching we do, including BLAST, is making use of a heuristic approach, which is to say we are willing to sacrifice a little bit of accuracy if we can win a lot of speed for it. Okay? So BLAST is a fine example of this. It's extremely fast, but it is not guaranteed to give you the best possible scoring for each pair of sequences. All right? And the last is evolutionary distance. I'm a protein guy, so I tend to do all of my comparisons at the protein level. Sometimes, however, that's not appropriate. If you're trying to understand the genetic distance between your cousin and your other cousin on the other side, then something like that is best determined with DNA because they're both human beings, right? So the amount of sequence vari variation you're going to have from one person to any other person is well below 1% on a genome-wide scale, all right? Now, there, there are people who will read this as saying that, you know, that, that, that there's that it's 
it's obvious that we're all just humans and that we, we can all be one big happy family uh, as a result. But so far it hasn't proven to be true. People have found very good ability to learn to hate people, which is terrible. <laughs> anyway, we are all one species. Our genes are all quite similar to each other. Uh, so evolutionary distance means that when, we, when, we're looking at, when we're looking for sequence comparisons between very distant relatives like yeast and me, I think that they're... I, could, I can say I'm not that related to yeast. I'm, it's been a long time, right? So it, we must look for a comparison across that distance with proteins. But if you're looking inside a species, you really need to be looking with DNA if you're going to find uh, these distances. Okay, so let us continue on. So there's still a bit more math to go. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> All right. I, do you have a, a fair bit of statistics training that you get as part of the honors program? No, that's so bad. Well, okay. I, so I taught statistics for the first time in my life last year here at UWC. Um, the same YouTube channel that you'll, sign, you'll find this talk uh, posted on also has a, a 12 lecture series called Statistically Speaking that I taught here. Um, it can help you to get up to speed on statistics if you have no background in it. It's kind of chatty. It talks about the history of it as well, which I think is kind of fascinating, but that's okay. Uh, right, so two probabilities make an odds ratio. All right, so to use a simple example, is it possible that I would die in a tornado in South Africa? People are saying, has anyone ever died in South Africa from a tornado? Okay, I grew up near Tornado Alley, so that's very dubious to me, but okay, we'll leave that one out. How about in a lightning strike? Has anyone in South Africa ever died of a lightning strike? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. All right, lightning strike. Does somebody want to put a number on this? Do I have a one in a million chance or a one in 10 million? One in 40, one in 40 million. So every, every year, <laughs> every year one person dies of, uh, of lightning strike in South Africa. We have, what, 57 million people now? Yeah. All right, so one in 57 million, you want to just go with that? We'll just yeah. use that. One in 57 million chance of dying of lightning strike. All right, now I have a phobia that I've developed since I moved to South Africa, and it has to do with these tiny little vans that get driven with bald tires, honking, showing their <laughs> hazard lights. One of them is going to kill me, I know. All right, so can we, can we make a, a round estimate? A, this is, this is just a, a number thrown out there. How many people a year in a population of 57 million die of taxis? What? 20,000? 20,000. You, you wanted to go a million? One in 50 people in South Africa die every year because of taxis? That's not fair. That's not fair. All right. So let us say, um, I need to put a number on this. We're, we're going to go with... Uh, well, I still have to divide 50,000 by, by 57 million. So let's say 57,000 people die of taxes every year. That's obviously just a, yeah. it, it, in, in statistics, is what I call a round number. It, it didn't come from a good place. <laughs> 57,000 people die a year uh, of, of taxes, let's say. I, I'm just casting aspersions very loosely now. This is going to get me in trouble. Uh, so that is a 1 in 1,000 chance. One in 1,000 chance every year of dying uh, by taxi. Okay. So we had a uh, one in 57 million chance of dying by lightning, or a one in uh, one in a thousand chance of dying by taxi. Those are each probabilities. Everyone sees that? You have a one in X chance of dying of this particular cause. All right. So if you were trying to decide. Should I be worried about dying by lightning, or should I really be worried about driving near those guys? <laughs> you might construct what we call an odds ratio. And an odds ratio is nothing more than the ratio of two probabilities. So I have the probability of dying by lightning strike and the probability of dying by taxi. And I tell you, what that, if you guided your life by odds ratios, what it would tell you is, if it's lightning, go ahead and walk outside. Who cares? But stay away from the bloody minibuses. <laughs> All right. Well, so that's a, it's a long story about my phobia. But I think that the point that will come across is that it is a, a rate relationship, a ratio of these two probabilities. So 
we can use the same technique, this probability ratio, for evaluating which amino acids are most likely to replace each other. Okay, so we can look at a whole bunch of places where evolution has created a conserved sequence, a lot of protein sequences, all for the same ortholog found across this species and that species and the other. We can stack them all up, and we can say how frequently do we see that in this ungapped region of sequence, Q, for example, is replaced by N, or D is replaced by E, or for that matter, D is replaced by P. Now, the side chains of amino acids may not be something that you obsess over quite as much as me. So let's, let's think about some of these, these, uh, these relationships. N and Q are asparagine and glutamine. Their side chains are very similar, but we just add a methyl to one. Serine and threonine are very similar. They both have OH side groups. They differ by having one extra carbon in them. So we have lots of pairs of amino acids that are very closely related to each other. Do we see then that similar amino acids with similar structure and chemistry are more likely to replace each other through evolutionary time than, by ran than expected by random chance? Blossom, Blossom 62, which is something that should be in very large capital letters, Blossom 62 is a hugely significant substitution matrix, and that substitution matrix acts as a scorecard when we're trying to ask, is this sequence similar to this other one? I'd I want everyone to be really, really clear on that point. Substitution matrices are our way of scoring whether two sequences are similar to each other or not. Blossom 62 is simply the most common uh, of the ones that we use. So this is what Blossom 62 looks like. So on the diagonal, we have the case of a particular letter replacing itself. So we see that leucine remains leucine uh, two to the fourth times as, uh, as frequently as you would expect by random chance alone. Something like tryptophan is even huger, two to the 11th. I, mo I, I left out one comment from our, logs ra our, our odds ratio discussion. These are given in log scale, okay? By log scale, I mean that when you see a zero, it means that these two probabilities are equal, essentially. That, they're, that uh, the probability of replacement is no greater than you would expect by random chance alone. When you see a negative number, this negative three gets is the exponent that we put on two. So negative, so two raised two, the negative third power is one eighth. All right. A positive three, on the other hand, like this one, means that this happens eight times more often than you'd expect by random chance. So it's a log scale for comparing these two ratios. They have to do that because if these two rate, if the two probabilities you're comparing are very different. Uh, you end up with really huge numbers, like 2 to the 11th. Okay, so where are the acceptable replacements here? I've highlighted them all in yellow, which is to say that we see that L replaces M four times as often as you would expect by random chance alone. All right, so we mentioned before that some of these pairs should be kind of obvious ones, D and E, for example. So here's the D column right here. Where's E? It's right there. We see that four times as often, D can be replaced by E as you would expect by random chance. That's how you could interpret this. Now, how does this relate to a sequence? Because all I've talked about so far is an individual amino acid being replaced by a single amino acid. Let's move ahead. At the top, I have two sequences. Just glancing at them, they don't look all that similar to me. They have some commonalities, but not a huge, huge amount. Camera's moving. All right. <laughs> Got to stay on stage. How's my hair? Is it okay? <laughs> so now we're, we're going to ask, what score do we get for each of these potential replacements? This is as aligned as we can make them. How does R compare to Y? What is R? Does anyone remember the, what that letter means? Arginine. Arginine. Very nice. What about Y? Arginine. It's not tryptophan. Tyrosine. Tyrosine. Very nice. So tyrosine and arginine, we've got a very, basic pro a very basic amino acid, and tyrosine is like this 
ring structure with an OH on it somewhere. Okay, so that score is minus two. Not very similar by this metric. The next position, E versus D, well, it likes that one. As we said, it gives that a plus two. G versus G, well, that's awesome. It's very, uh, it's not just the same letter, it, it's um, staying the same letter it happens more often than we expect by random chance, it gets a six. A versus T, meh. D versus D, fine, great, yes. A versus C, mm -hmm. So we can walk our way across, and each of those values, we can simply look up the letter in Blossom 62. At the end of the day, our final score for how these two sequences align to each other is simply adding all of those values up. Weird, huh? So it's a big lookup table built from evolutionarily uh, related sequences that helps us to know which replacements are accepted by evolution and which ones are rejected by evolution. Okay. There it is. Cool. Right, so on we go. Now, this is a little complex, but I think you need to see it just the same. S Smith Waterman and Needleman Wunsch are two of the earliest algorithms that we used for doing these alignments between pairs of sequences. Sometimes when you have an alignment, you have sequences that differ in length. And in fact, they incorporate insertions and deletions that have happened over evolutionary time. So when you have something like that, you can look at one sequence on the horizontal axis and another sequence on the vertical axis. And then we can, we can uh, mark within this, uh, within this map places where the same letter appears in a given column and row. That's going to be a, a place that, if, if you can incorporate this square, you get a plus one in your sequence alignment, basically, or a plus uh, whatever. How does this work? Oh, sorry. <laughs> so uh, in this case, the software is able to find that if it, if it uses a, uh, a compaction in the sequence, if it, uh, if it deletes a letter out of the sequence, it is able to create a path that optimizes the alignment between these two sequences. So this, this process is one that we call dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is hugely important in the world of optimal scoring aligners. It is not, however, how you see things like blast working. So I'm going to move beyond that for the moment and, and go ahead to talk about BLAST. The creators of BLAST had a really great insight. They said sequence databases are getting really, really big, really, really fast. And they've been getting really, really big, really, really fast for a really long time now. You guys are coming into graduate school at a time when databases are gargantuan compared to what they looked like when I was in grad school. Because sequencing has become so commonplace that we have loads of orthologs for any given protein, really. So when we, um, when we use BLAST, we are taking a shortcut. And that shortcut was that the, the authors of BLAST realized that if sequences are similar to each other, if they do bear an evolutionary relationship to each other, they're almost sure to have at least a few amino acids that are identical. And they realized that they could use this identity as a, a way to really speed up searching. So the seed matching that they make use of relies on the fact that they say similar sequences must have at least three identical amino acids in a row. That's, that's a shortcut. So I, I said earlier that optimal algorithms attempt to give you the, what is provably the best correspondence between two sequences, whereas heuristics tend to give you a fast answer that may not be provably the best. So this seeding approach marks BLAST as a heuristic. It's only going to test whether sequences are similar if they have regions of identity within them, identical residues. So uh, its approach is to use, uh, to look for three letter amino acid sequences, or I think seven nucleotides, I've forgotten exactly, maybe it's 12. But um, you have to use more nucleotides than you use uh, protein uh, amino acids simply because there are more kinds of amino acids to work from. Okay, so finding all of the sequences that bear at least a seed match, that have at least a very short region of identity between sequences, we can then seek out what's called a maximal segment pair. I'll just tell you right now, that's one of my favorite questions to ask about. What is a maximal segment pair? So, what is a maximal segment pair? We're going to, we're going to walk through that visually in just a minute. 
But a maximal segment pair represents an extension from this region of identity through regions that are merely similar. Okay, so the maximal segment pair is this area broadened out from the seed that's going to be scored as the match. Okay, and I have to mention this because it's one of the things that makes BLAST what it is. Carlin and Altschul were able to publish in 1990, the same year the original BLAST publication came out, a way to map the scores that came back from similarity search in BLAST to a, <coughs> a, what's called an expectation value. So an expectation value is the number of alignments with scores at least as good as the one you saw that you would have expected to occur by random chance. So if you see an expect value of one on a search, you should say, all right, well, this search gave me nothing. Because you expect a score at least this good to have occurred by random chance alone. If you have a score, uh, if you have an expectation score of one and 10, then it's saying, well, you should have searched 10 databases this size before you found one that, that matched this well by random chance alone. Expectation values have been used throughout, uh, throughout bioinformatics, not just in the context of homology search. So it's another one of those concepts like odds ratios, the, the odds ratios, um, that, that show up everywhere. Okay, so how does this work? First off, we need to find which sequences in this database share a sequence with the one that, that's been entered by the user, by the query sequence. So I've mentioned before that we can chop up a sequence into KMERS. We're going to do it again. But this time, we're going to cut this KSSGSSYPS sequence into three-letter KMERS. So KSS, SSG, SGS, GSS, etc. Each of those gets represented in this tree structure. Now, it might not be obvious to you how the three-letter sequences from up there apply down here, but I'm going to point out that they're, they're real. First off, there are four different sequences of three letters that start with S in there. Can you see them? Mm -hmm. I see SSG, SGS, SSY, and SYP. All of those are three-letter sequences starting with the letter S. All of those are represented by this branch out of this tree. SGS, SSG, SSY, and SYP. Everyone sees that? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is called a dictionary tree, or an ahochoracic data structure, if you really care about it. it, it it's a, a type of, of uh, software structure that we call a finite state machine. Why is it useful to organize things in this way? The really cool thing is that if you have a query sequence that's been turned into a dictionary tree, you can run the entire dictionary, the, the entire set of sequence databases, uh, the, the entire set of sequences from the database, through this tree, and discover hits. So normally I, would, I love having the students sort of uh, act as the pointers in the data structure. We're not going to do that today, I'm sorry. But you can see that when you hit a Y, you get a big hit over here. But the software doesn't care about getting a hit in this row. It only cares when you get down to here. So we have a hit on the Y. And so when you check the next letter, N, it sees, can I move from Y to an N? No, nope, not represented here. So that one falls right off. What happens when we're at, say, this I? Is there any sequence of three letters starting with I? Okay, we ignore that. How about A? Is A the first letter of a three-letter sequence? No. How about S? Yes. Yeah, we already said S was. We like S a lot. All right, so here's S. We move to the next letter. Our pointer now moves, shoop, right down here to G. Here's another S. Can we move to S? Yes. And suddenly this bell goes off. Ding, 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 ding. We've got a hit. By, by having moved through this data structure, by getting a pointer advanced all the way down to the bottom, the software recognizes, yes, there's a common three-letter sequence between the query sequence and this particular entry in the database. And it can do that with one pass through the database. Find all instances of any three-letter combination from the query sequence. I think that's amazingly cool. Very useful kind of structure to know. Okay. So now we have a list of sequences that contain at least one shared three-letter sequence. Next, we need to form the maximal segment pair in each of those sequence hits. So we might have hit MCT, for example. But in this case, the same sequence also hits another three-letter sequence, RPE. Now this other stuff is more difficult. Now we need to find 
what are the what are the bounds of the region that have regions of uh, where that defines the similarity between these sequences? If you have a whole bunch of things like p versus r, p versus r doesn't get a, a positive score at all. It's a very negative score, in fact, uh, in the Blossom 62 matrix. So we have we have a big cost to moving into an r versus p situation. However, something like k versus h, that's okay by Blossom. D versus E, I think we've already mentioned, both acidic residues, it's a positive score. So we can build our score by, by extending further into regions of similarity, but the score drops as we move through regions that have nothing to do with each other. So the software have to, has to optimize this. It needs to find the right amount it can push out these margins to encompass all the similarity around this, this uh, particular seed. Everyone sees that? The maximal segment pair, then, this region that maximizes the score between these two sequences, is what it reports the, the score, the expectation value for in the end. Okay, that's BLAST. Maximal segment pair is a very important concept to understanding BLAST. All right. Now, I am, uh, I'm going to take a brief moment here to, uh, to have some tea. I think it might be useful if folks have questions so far. We covered an awful lot of material. This used to be, you know, a couple of weeks of the class I taught in bioinformatics. Okay. Necessarily, what we're doing is called a survey. This is, it, we can't do a deep dive on how aligners work or a, a deep dive on finite state automata. You could have a whole class just on those concepts. Instead, we're, we're, we're kind of skating over the surface, and that's necessary simply because bioinformatics is so very, very broad. If, if my goal were that each of you could write a hidden Markov model, this would look like an entirely different class. Uh, so the goal here is that you recognize what these algorithms are. You have some notion of how they operate. So it's, it's, a, it's a limited goal for bioinformatics, but I, I hope that it makes you better prepared to read the literature and to see what people are using uh, in their papers. OK, with a gulp of tea, I feel ready to go again. All right. So let us let's continue on. Let's start with the central dogma of structural biology. Now I, I think everyone knows the central dogma of molecular biology. The whole Watson and Crick DNA gives rise to RNA through a process of transcription and blah 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 blah. You could probably quote chapter and verse with stuff like that. But it's important as well that you be exposed to the central dogma of structural biology. So up at the top we see that a given sequence goes through some sort of energy minimization process by which it adopts a structure. So sequence, the, the sequence of a, of a polypeptide, for example, gives rise to hydrogen bonds, you get alpha helices forming and stuff like that. It adopts a structure. Structure allows us to carry out some sort of function for this biological sequence. So generally speaking, if you have different sequences that can lead to roughly the same structure, you may be able to assume similar function. Most generally, though, the data that we have available to us are sequences. The number of different protein folds that are known is in the tens or hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions by now. But the number of sequences we have dwarfs that by a huge factor. All right. So when we, when we go trying to determine the function of a novel protein. Maybe it's got no homolog. I mentioned this problem earlier, that we have genes uh, for a, a given species. We've got no idea what it does. It's not similar to a protein from another species. That happens a lot. So maybe we can still discern something about how it operates through sequence motifs, structural domains, and protein families. So a, a sequence motif is a conserved element of a protein sequence alignment. It is usually correlated with a particular function because, the, because of this commonality of structure. A structural domain is an element of, of, of overall structure within a protein that is self-stabilizing and often folds independently of the rest of the protein chain. After all, the, the letters that become an alpha helix don't really have to coordinate all that much with amino acids outside that region. Okay, now protein families reflect the fact that we often have many members of, of uh, 
uh, many different proteins from different species that all fall in the same functional category. So protein families are one of these other higher levels that we talk about. We're going to talk about how we, we, we dig into these. So we're going to start with the position-specific scoring matrix. Sometimes you've got 20 sequences that, that all seem to carry out the same kind of DNA binding, for example, or the same interaction with ATP, or something along those lines. These are motifs, sequence motifs, and when we want to find more of them, we frequently construct what's called a possum from them. So a possum is going to be more or less a table where uh, each row is what score you might give a particular amino acid at this position, and each, uh, e each column represents a different location within this short sequence. We'll be looking at an example of this in just a minute. So it's a little like a hidden Markov model, because we, we mentioned that the Markov model has different emission probabilities, different sequences you're likely to see for each of the states along a biological process. But in this case, there's only one sequence you can go through, because the possum is going to say, the, out, the, uh, the letter you see at this position should be one of these, the letter at this position should be one of these, probably with a score associated with each of them. So let's try to uh, walk through what that looks like. This is an example for the basic leucine zipper. Proteins frequently need to interact with DNA, and one of the ways they do that is through a basic leucine zipper. So we have, a, uh, we have the ability to interact with the DNA molecule, which is an acid at the end of the day, by this basic interaction. So we can have sort of an acid-base uh, association between the two. In this case, we have a whole series of sequences that are associated with the zipper. And we see that we've got a few positions that have been marked as really key, highly conserved aspects of the leucine zipper. These are characteristic bits of the sequence. So I would start by asking, do we have exactly the same letter all up and down each of those columns? No. We do not. But it's pretty clear that there's a strong preference at these marked locations that have been marked with a hash symbol. So we see things like F, F, K, K, F, K, K, L, K, R. So F is a very rare amino acid. They are not all equal in how frequently they're seen. But we see that F is quite frequently used here, as is lysine. Um, and arginine and lysine, uh, arginine and leucine also show up. So this is, this is not a perfectly conserved position. Over here we have K, 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 R, R. That's a pretty clear preference for lysine at this position. Over here, well, we've got a bit of a mix again. K, K, M, V, R, K, 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 K. So because the sequences show a, a clear preference for one letter or another within these positions, we can use the presence of a letter at that position in another sequence aligned with this as a, as a scoring point in its favor to say, ah, this very strongly conforms to what we would expect for a leucine zipper. And thus you get a good score on it. All right. So, a website called Interpro is one of the most common ways that people make use of these conserved, uh, conserved domains. The, the example I showed you before, the, the leucine zipper, was from a, a database called Conserved Domain Database over at NCBI. But rather than go to all these different databases for each of the different motifs that you might want to search, it's an awful lot easier to simply use the Interpro website, feed it a sequence, and see what it hits. So Interpro uses things like regular expressions. If you've got a friend who talks a lot about how cool Linux is, he or she has probably <coughs> mentioned regular expressions at some point. So regular expressions are a way to look for patterns very quickly in text files on Linux. So um, regexes are one of the ways that we define what these, what these highly conserved regions look like. Possums we've just mentioned. Possums were the, the position-specific scoring matrices we just showed. There are approaches that use clustering to try to find these patterns. And our good friend, the hidden Markov model, shows up again. It's not just that, it's, it's not just that a PSSM is sort of a limited uh, a way to construct the hidden Markov models, but full-on hidden Markov models have also found their way into this domain matching. So 
Uh, Uniprot Knowledge Base serves as a, a source for all of these sequences that have been produced, Tremble and, and Swissprot together. And Interpro Scan is the, is the software that goes looking for these motifs when new sequences are deposited to the database. Now, uh, I've, I've given a paper by Hunter et al. from 2009 on this, but I wanted to mention that one of the, one of the researchers who's contributed a lot to Interpro is actually a researcher over at University of Cape Town, Nikki Mulder, who runs the C-Bio group, has an awful lot to do with the success of Interpro. So, uh, when, we, when we look at the report that comes back, it's sometimes helpful to have a good test case. Now, back when I was in the United States, um, I, I got the chance to work as an expert witness in, in federal trials. They had found a, a fellow that they had accused of uh, creating ricin uh, to kill a family member. It was a terrible, terrible thing. And the defense asked me if I could evaluate the way that the government was trying to prove that what this guy had in his refrigerator was really ricin. It was an amazing experience. So ricin is a protein that I, I have a very strong affinity for. It bought me a car. <laughs> so, <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, the, the way that the government was testing for it at the time was not very good. But they used a much better strategy after we beat them up about it. So, <laughs> all right. So when you hand in a sequence, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. What was your question? Oh, okay. It was, a, it was a really wild experience. It, it's a very different kind of interrogation than you get when you, you know, stand up for your, doing your PhD evaluation. So when you pass a sequence to Interpro, it's going to give you some indication, a graphical depiction of where domains and repeats hit within this arbitrary sequence. So in the first place, uh, we see a couple hits to IPR001574. Uh, so in this case, the, the developers at Interpro realized that these two different definitions, one from the PF series and another one from SSF, that these signatures were pointing to exactly the same feature. So they gave them one <laughs> IPR number that relates to both features. And in this case, it's ribosome inactivating protein. So that's down at the N terminus of the protein. What do we have at the at the C terminus? Oh, sorry, the C, uh, yeah, at the C terminus of the protein, the right hand of the sequence. We see that at the left hand, we've got the RIP, the ribosome inactivated protein. At the right, we see a bunch of lectin domains. So that's, that's kind of a, a clinical story about what, what these different features do. But why is ricin something that the federal government cares about? Why, why would it matter to them whether ricin exists in somebody's refrigerator or not? Breaking Bad. <laughs> so yes, Breaking Bad is an example of a series that's used uh, ricin as part of its story. So, Ricin is dangerous because it has a, a, a lectin domain. And what do lectins interact with? Does anyone know? Proteins that are lectins interact specifically with particular carbohydrates. In this case, it interacts with a particular sugar on the outside of cells. When it interacts with that sugar, the cell receives it as a signal to draw this thing into the cell, to envelop it and bring it in, as a, to phagocytize it. All right. So this lectin, you can think of as the door knocker. Ricin shows up at the cell and it says, hey you, twist that sugar, let me in. <laughs> All right. Now this other end of it is the RIP, and it's very, very appropriately name, named. A ribosome inactivating protein is, does just that. We obviously need our ribosomes to be making proteins, and if the ribosome is inactivated by ricin's attack, you're in a very big world of hurt. So a very tiny amount of ricin can kill you. So, the, in this case, the, uh, the, the court found the man guilty, actually, of having produced ricin uh, to, to settle a dispute with his father-in-law, I think. Kind of a terrible thing. I got involved in another trial after that, and that guy, he got put away for a very, very long time. He sent it to political figures. You don't want to do that with ricin. It's a very bad idea. Okay, so ricin, and we have a story. And I like telling that story here because it has this, this two-part functionality built into the protein sequence, and the signatures that it hits within Interpro reveals that functionality very clearly. If you have some protein sequence and you don't understand which part does what, Interpro is your best friend. Okay. Whew, we talked about an awful lot of stuff, so I'm going to try to summarize it all together by saying, first off, assembly genomes is greatly aided by paired end sequencing. When we have paired end sequencing, we're able to recognize that different contigs belong next to each other. 
That concept is hugely important in, in assembly. Repetitive sequences might mistakenly cause you to think that distant features are actually quite close together. That's not so helpful. So we need to screen those out through the process of recognizing that sequences associated with repetitive sequences uh, show up at very high counts. So we have to remove those before we start doing our Wailerian graphs, or our, our Wailerian cycles in the Debrain graph. Okay, next. Hidden Markov models are very, very valuable for recognizing instances of biological, uh, biologically complex features. So in, in the case of gene scan, we find that HMMs are very powerful for telling us where the protein coding genes are to be found in a long sequence. So HMMs are very good for that. Uh, aligning sequences was the original killer app of bioinformatics. By, by being able to use BLAST, new biology suddenly became possible uh, by, by making the ability to search through millions of sequences trivial. So that is a big deal. It continues to be critically important in molecular biology. We didn't talk about some of the, uh, the other features like multiple sequence alignment that we might use if we have a bunch of sequences from different species and we want to see which parts are most conserved, for example. But these techniques also rely on alignment. Certainly, Interpro is relying upon alignment. It's using things like uh, possums to, to find where these uh, sequence motifs may be found. That is an awful lot of content, all jammed together in the space of two hours. I hope, though, that it means that when you're faced with a sequence for the first time and you've got no idea what parts do what, you think to yourself, I, I bet I could use Interpro. Or if you're trying to interpret uh, the result of having searched some sequence in a sequence database, that you have some guide to figuring out what that expectation value means at the end of the day. Um, I hope that you realize that if you're going to be using alignment of anything, um, probably something like uh, Blossom 62 or an earlier uh, approach called PAM, that that's fueling how it decides what's similar to it uh, to others. Uh, this this lecture will be online uh, indefinitely, so if you uh, if, if you need to come and refer back to it to get an idea of how to pursue a problem, that's fine. Um, I'm also over here on Thursdays, except I'm about to hit my travel schedule for a bit. So, but by uh, Mid-June, I should be back here uh, for a nice long time, a nice long stretch, and you can find me every day, uh, every Thursday, uh, over at uh, what we used to be Bongani and Dimba's office. So, uh, we'll, uh, I hope to, to get to see with you, uh, to, to sit with you if you end up with problems that need some bioinformatics attention. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, the, the second lecture will, will be available by. Uh, uh, off, uh, will be shown on, uh, on the projector here. Uh, it's also already available on the YouTube channel if you really want to skip ahead. The third lecture, though, I'm going to come back and give in person. I really, really feel strongly about differential expression of genes, so I, I, I'm glad I get to talk with you in person about that one. Mm -hmm. All right, with that said, very nice to meet you all, and I'll see you in early May. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.